Terrible. So, chapter 16 is about appraisal analysis, appraisals in general. What do we do? What's what required? How do we do one? How do we reconcile one? And how do we calculate everything? So, we're just going to get through the slides and then I'm going to show you how to calculate them because a lot of this is going to be surrounding the math piece of it. So appraisal regulations regulated by the FERIA. FERIA is the Financial Institutions Reform Recovery Enforcement Act. We have two things that came out of that. We have the Appraisal Standards Board and we have the Appraisal Qualifications Board. The Qualification Board is about testing, right? They're about the testing, and then we have the qualification or the uh, standards board, which would be about standards of practice, correct? Right? Minimum standards, right? We always have to have some type of baseline standard. Um, then we have these things called state certified appraisers. That's who does appraisals. That's who does these federally related transactions that we're not allowed to do. Remember, we appraise property, but we don't do appraisals. Mm -hmm. So. Certify residential appraisers and certify general appraisals. Residential does what? Residential pro property, right? General does other things too. Business and commercial. Just like you specialize, they specialize. We talked about federally related transactions. We said that, right? Real estate agents can do appraisals as long as there's two things. They can form to USPAP, the Uniform Standards Appraisal, professional appraisal practices, right? And they're not federally related, so cash transactions, private money transactions, those things are not federally related, right? But if it's federally related, it's a land loan from a savings association, a credit union, a commercial bank, backed by Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, Freddie Mac, we talked about those, right? Then you have to be a licensed appraiser. Real estate related financial loan transactions, sales, lease, exchanges, financing, et cetera, because we also do appraisals for rents. We do rent schedules and stuff like that as well. And if it involves a financial regulatory agency like a bank or a commercial credit union, you have to be licensed. Requires the services of an appraisal is what it says here. You have to be licensed. You have to be state certified or licensed. It must conform to that USPAP we talked about. So anytime there's federal related transactions, anytime you get a loan, it's set for private money, you have to have a certified appraiser. And we talked about Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA. Mm -hmm. right? FHA, VA is Jenny Mae. These are called non-conventional or conventional mortgages. Right? Here's the USPAP, Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. They set guidelines for the appraisal service. It requires objective and impartial appraisals, so we can't pay somebody. We can't show up and say, here's my comps. Here's how I got the value. Here's a gift certificate for two dozen donuts and some coffee. We can't do that, right? Back in the day, that's what real estate agents did. I showed up with a comp in my hand and said, hey, this is how I got my value. Please use these so you can, come, so you can get it. Okay, back in the day, that's what we did. But do we still do that today? No, you're not allowed to. If you do that, so the appraiser's supposed to define the job and go away. So now that's why we had that's why we had the mortgage crisis because mm -hmm. things were so loosely defined. It was legal for me to do that back in the day. Not anymore. I'll get in trouble. The appraiser's supposed to define the assignment, and walk away. And walk away. They're supposed to do. Right. So establishes the record keeping requirements. How long we have to keep things on file. Confidential appraiser client relationships. And now it gets ordered through a system and the lender doesn't even know who it is until it's after after they receive it, mm -hmm. right? Now, that doesn't mean I can't talk to the appraiser, right? Lender sends out the appointment request. The appraiser then calls me and says, hey, I need to get into the property by this certain day. A lot of times they have a lockbox key. They don't even need us, right? They get in. But then they might call me and say, hey, the house down the street sold for this. Can you tell me about this contract? I have some questions. They're allowed to ask you questions. You're just not allowed to influence them. I've even had them call me and ask me for comps. That's fine if they asked you for it, you can help them. But if they don't ask you, you don't volunteer information, right? Um, appraisers will help you out. You can call them back and say, hey, listen, this is closing. 
They just finished these repairs that you requested on the appraisal subject to, the value subject to, the roof being repaired, the roof is done, would you mind going back and taking a look at it? That's fine, you're allowed to tell them that so that you don't waste their time, they don't waste their time, right? But it's unethical to accept compensation based on value. So you can't say, well, if you get $400,000 for this house, you get $4,000. If you get $300,000 for this house, you only get $3,000. You can't do that. You can't do a compensation based on the value of the house. So back in the day, people would get paid based on how high the price was. Well, that automatically makes people want to give a higher value because they're making more money, right? So 475, you, you realize everything in real estate is under chapter 475, right? So licensees may perform appraisals for compensation. We can perform appraisals for compensation. They can't be federally related. It has to conform to the uniform set, um, professional standards right? Um, uniform standards of professional appraisal practices, U USPAP, they say, USPAP. I don't know why they say USPAP, I say it's USPAP. Um, USPAP. We can't perform, it says here again, can't perform federal related. You're going to see a question on this. I've said it now four times during the class. You'll see it. It will be on a state exam. I promise you. Can't refer to themselves as a certified. I can't say I'm a certified appraiser unless I am a certified appraiser. Some real estate agents are certified appraisers. So you can have dual. You can, but most don't. Is because it hard appraisal, to appraisal, you have to do an apprenticeship. You get your license, you do a two year apprenticeship, but there's a lot of work involved in being an appraisal. And if you're not super analytical, you probably don't want to go down that route. CMAs and BPOs. CMAs are comparative market analysis. BPOs are broker price opinions. They do not have to comply to the USPAP, UPAP, USPAP, 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 however you want to call it. We're not doing appraisals. They're not appraisals, right? We appraise property, but we don't do appraisals. These are how we appraise property. So we have, we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about this whole concept of value, cost, price and value. I like to write this one on the board. So we have cost, price, and value. <clears throat> if I have a house listed at 450,000 and the appraised value, the appraisal is 420,000, but I paid 440 for it. There's a difference, right? These things mean different things, right? Mm -hmm. The cost of the house is what I paid for the house, mm -hmm. right? The cost is what I paid for the house. No matter what the house is worth, the cost of the house is what I paid for the house. So cost equals pay. So in this case, the cost of the house is 440,000, right? So I paid 440, so the cost is 440, right? Mm -hmm. The price is the amount paid. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. The cost is what it costs to build, sorry. I forgot to put that, the builder. So it was 450 built. Yeah, I'm just going to put 450 bill, okay? That's true. That would make sense. Right. This is going to be sold at a loss, but just for example, right? The cost of, so the cost is what, what? Sorry. Let's back up, fix this. The cost is what it costs to build. So if you think about that, think about replacement costs. When you go to do your insurance estimator, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to ask you, is it wood frame or is it brick, right? Do you have shingle roof or a tile roof, right? Do you have a poured slab or is it on crawl space? Do you have a two car garage or do you have no garage? All these things, is it one story, is it two story? Is it stucco, is it brick? They're gonna ask you all these questions. Based on that, they're gonna create an estimated cost for a rebuild, right? So that cost for rebuild is here, okay? Cost for rebuild is here whatever it takes to rebuild it, whatever it takes to build, whatever it takes to bring it back where, to bring it, it, back where it should be is what the cost is, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what you're paying Total to cost. build something, right? The price is what you paid on the contract price. Right? 
whatever you pay is the price, right? Because that's what you paid for. Mm -hmm. The value is what it appraised at. The value is what it's really worth, right? The value is what it's really worth. So I paid twenty thousand dollars over appraisal for this one. So was that a good value? No. No. Now the loan has to be less than four twenty. I would only imagine. Correct. So in my case, I would negotiate the price to come down to match the value. Mm -hmm. You want the price to be as close to the value or lower. Or by with that. The price to be lower or as close to value as possible, right? You don't ever want it to be higher because then you're losing money. So you have to understand that value is with appraisal, whatever it's worth to the buyers, right? Value is what it's worth to the buyers and sellers at a certain time. When you say appraised, you say appraised value. What was the appraised value? The word value is in that. So remember, the appraisal goes with value, right? Cost goes with rebuild. Price goes with what you paid. Yeah. Right? Should be easy. But I even I messed it up again because I always like to misspeak. Um, but it's also keeping you on your toes. You can remember stuff, right? There's going to be a question on this. Good? Yeah, good. You might read it. Cost says expenditure to create an improvement. Labor, materials, and land. Right? Price is the amount paid, the contract price. Value is what it's worth to at any given time. Value is the appraised value. Very simple. Very short. So we have these different types of value. We have assessed value, we have insurance value, we have investment value, we have going concern value, liquidation value, and salvage value, right? And we're gonna go over each one of these types of value, right? Oh, and they didn't put this in the bullets, we have market value, right? Market value is the most likely price that a property is gonna sell at. Based on recent sales, assumes a buyer and actors, or buyers and sellers are acting prudently, they understand what's going on, they're at least somewhat in tune with the market, the price is not affected by undue stimulus, right? So what that means is this is assumptions that everything is very similar, right? There's not something illegal going on. There's not a straw buyer. There's not, we're not pushing the price up. We're not doing something outside of the norm. Like somebody passed away, somebody's distraught, they want to sell their house really quick and they sell it for a hundred thousand under value, that would be undue stimulus, right? We don't want we want to make sure we're doing things at market at normal price. So assumption of market value it assumes a specific date, right? It assumes that closing date is the date we're going to use for recording. Right? The buyers and sellers are typically motivated. They need a larger space, they need a downsize they have to relocate for their job, maybe they got divorced. Whatever the case is, there's some type of motivation to sell. You don't just move for no reason, you move for some reason. The market was great, I decided to capitalize on my equity. That's motivation to move, right? Both parties are informed and advised, you would think. A lot of people aren't advised, there's a thing called a for sale by owner that they're not advised and half the time they sell their house for way under where they should. Right? Why? Because they don't want to pay a commission because Commission is too expensive. Well, guess what? If you sell your house for forty thousand less, and the commission was only ten thousand dollars, you just lost thirty thousand dollars. Most for sale buyers don't care. They don't want to deal with an agent because we make too much money. Well, they lost money because they didn't want to work with us. That's fine. If they want to do that. That's their choice. But don't ruin your neighbor's values because you don't like realtors. Okay, it happens all the time. All the time. Uh, reasonable time is allowed in the open market, what's reasonable? Well, reasonable is relative, right? It might be 120 days, it might be five days, it might be two hours, depending on where we are in the market. Now, my guess is next week, average days on the market is gonna be say 80 to 90 days, right? So if you're taking a two month listing, you're shooting yourself in the foot, you should be taking longer listings because of the market conditions. Right. Payments are made in cash, U.S. dollars, or some type of comparable, right? Everybody says, well, I only want to deal with cash offers. Guess what? A loan is cash at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's all cash in your bank account, whether it's a loan right. or, or not. It's cash in your bank account. Price is not affected by 
special financing like seller financing or seller concessions. Now what's a concession? A concession is when we're giving you something back, right? So you buy a house for 350,000 and we give you $10,000 towards closing costs and $5,000 for towards repairs. At this point, that $350,000 offer is now a $335,000 offer. That's what a concession is. We're giving you something in return. Credits. Some type of credit. Maybe it's a $2,000 carpet allowance. Maybe, maybe we're giving you a gift of equity. It could be any of these things, right, that, that changes this. So here's your characteristics of value. It's another acronym. If you realize by now, real estate's full of all these acronyms, right? From fresh corns to college to DC, deep sea, now we have dust, right? Yes. <laughs> a bar sale. All these things are acronyms, right? Demand, utilities, scarcity, and transferability. And we're gonna go through each one of these and make sure you understand that. But demand is easy, right? You understand what demand is. Everybody knows what demand is. It's how, how much desire there is for a property, right? We're gonna go through all these at the same time. So we have, so when we price these homes, we use this principle of substitution. So we have a subject property, and then we have comparables that are close comparables, right? They, they're similar properties, but they're not the same. But in order to get that price, we have to substitute it. We have to substitute, maybe this is a four bedroom, and the comp is a three bedroom. Well, we have to add a bedroom, and bedrooms were $2,000, so we change the price. And, right? That's kind of how this principle of substitution works. So sets that upper limit of value. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna pick three or four homes that are similar and based on the average and reconcile price, we're gonna say, okay, this house is worth this much, right? Properties are always sold, or we try to sell with the highest and best use. Most profitable use of a property that's legally permissible, physically possible and financially feasible. So let's talk about this for a second. So I had a piece of agricultural property that was 18 acres listed over on the west side. It's got a thousand feet of road frontage on Normandy Boulevard. It's a nice piece of commercial. You would think it'd be a nice piece of commercial property, it's zoned agricultural. Why was it zoned agricultural? It was zoned agricultural because they didn't want to pay as much taxes on it. Because the tax rate is lower because the assessed value is lower. Right. Able to change that, right? So, they, so they tried to sell it for a million dollars, agricultural. Well, agricultural, it was only worth 540000 right? Okay. Uh -huh. So we listed it for a million dollars, but it was agricultural. So did we get any offers on it? Yeah. No, we didn't get any offers on it, right? But if they were to change the zoning to commercial, Making, they would have been able to get $800,000, at least, right? Let's say 50,000 an acre versus 30,000 an acre, that'll put them at 900,000. But they were scared they were gonna have to pay taxes. Because they had a rezone? They case. never got rezoned and they're still trying to sell the property. Should you today. rezone it before you try you, to? You have to rezone it because it's yeah. sold at the highest and best use. Yeah. So I've got another property for getting ready to put on the market. It's, it's off of 103rd Street and it's got a mobile home on it. It's got a mobile home on it, it's two acres and it's zoned commercial office. Well. It's worth two hundred thousand commercial office, but it's worth one hundred and ten thousand residential, right? So why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we try to sell it yeah. the way it is, right? So, so we want to do the highest. So that's what we're talking about: legally permissible. I can't sell that agricultural property as commercial because it's not zoned that way. But if I have a hearing, do the zoning change, then I can sell it for a higher property value, right? If it doesn't sell, you've got higher property taxes. <laughs> That's where you have to be careful, right? So you see the little orange signs on the side of the road says the hearing's going to be about this property. It's yeah. going to be zoned put. That's what it is. Oh, okay, so the rezoning. Oh, interesting. I thought they had yeah. paid it. One person can show up and oppose that, and it can change the whole thing. Really? Right? Do they? Is that common? Sometimes when there's like really? feuds and stuff, people do. Oh, let's go. They have two of those. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen those. Signs. So PUD yeah. means planned unit development. So it's like a housing development. So if you see PUD, they're going to build a development. How would the property be? So it says as though vacant ads. Do I really need to go over this? Improved versus vacant. Vacant means what? There's nobody there, right? Mm -hmm. Potential highest and best uh, use of a site determines the value. Legal use produces the greatest value, right? And then as improved, it says how would the improvements increase the value? 
should the improvements be taken down, would the value be more, right? So in the case of the mobile home on the commercial office zoning, it would be better to demolish the, the mobile home because the mobile home's from 1984. It's 84. Right, you can't get financing on 1984 mobile home. Why? Because it's a car and it's over 30 years old. It's not worth it, right? Right. So this is why. Where's the, where's it located, the mobile home for what, two acres? On 103rd Street. Right on 103rd. I'm not gonna tell you exactly where because it's not listed yet. And I don't want people to watch my videos and go after it. Yes, sir, right. I apologize. <laughs> so, more principles of value, right? Increasing and decreasing returns. Now, I shouldn't really need to worry about explaining that to you, but I do need to explain the, the over-improvement. Over-improvement means what? I have a $500,000 house in a neighborhood where everything else is 200,000, right? Maybe it's way larger. Maybe I put quartz countertops and everybody else has Formica. Maybe I put in a pool when everybody else has nothing, nothing right? What over-improvement means, I'm not gonna get back the money that I put in. Right? Does the property conform? Is it similar to the rest of the area? We hear the term cookie cutter, cookie mm -hmm. cutter neighborhood. Cookie cutter neighborhoods tend to retain their value better, right? Because everything's the same. When they sell, they, they all kind of increase the same. Assemblage and plot, just put the things together, right? Progression and regression. So progression is forward, regression is moving back. It's like value. Basically, how's it ever going? Is it getting better? Is it not? HOA is going to control this, right? Mm -hmm. right? HOAs keep you from regressing, right? Because they're not letting people let the grass grow up 500 feet mm -hmm. and per paint their garage doors pink with purple polka dots and stuff like that, right? Progression would be things like Springfield, where they're improving the neighborhood, right? It's a, it's a progress, right? It's going forward, right? We're developing new restaurants and bringing in more money. And so that's that's what they're talking about, right? Values are going up because we're progressing in the neighborhood, like your rehab that you're doing, right? It's increasing the values in the neighborhood because mm -hmm. the house is getting improved, right? But he's over improving it. His over improvement will be at a loss, but the other neighbors will gain. So he's making it a four two, and I don't think there's four twos in the area, so but it shouldn't be. It'll be a rental though. Yeah, it's fine. It, it is a, it's a buy and hold. It's a different case, but it is increasing the neighborhood. It's making it, it is better. making it better, right? So we have these three different approaches for for actually doing valuations of the house. We have the cost approach, which is what we do. We call it the com cost. Uh, sorry, cost approach. We have a comparative sales approach. We have the comparative sales approach is what we do. We do cost approach too, but not as much. The cost approach is more for um, investment and insurance companies and stuff like that, right? We do sales comparison. Income approach is for investors, right? Income approach. They do this uh, rent schedule, for example. So three different ones. Appraiser's gonna use all three. Theoretically, they use all three. Most of the time they give you two on the appraisal. And which one, what's the relevance of each approach? I'm not necessarily gonna agree with these, but uh, this is what the textbook says. Vacant lots in established neighborhoods and single family homes will be under sales comparison, right? Income producing properties, rentals, right? Investors for income approach, cost approach, new construction. That's true, special purpose properties, which would be like zoning variances, et cetera, and cross check other approaches. So this is used as like your checks and balances, right? This is also what insurance agents use to value property. It's not listed on here, but you'll see sales comparison and cost approach most of the time. If you're buying something for like a DSCR loan, which is a debt service coverage ratio, they're gonna do an income approach on a schedule, 1007 schedule, so that you know what the projected rent's gonna be for the property, we're gonna use that to offset the loan DTI. So here's what the sales comparative approach is. This is what we do as a CMA. Values estimated by reviewing the comps, the recent sales, similar to the subject property. So a 2,500 square foot house is not a comp to a 1,500 square foot house. And we'll, we'll briefly hit on that in a second. Sales have to be occurred recently. Recently usually means six months. It really depends on the property. If it's a really sparse area for sales, you might have to go back a year. Uh, comparative properties must be similar to the subject property, said to be 
somewhat similar, similar condition, similar shape, similar size. Um, a home that's 1960 is not the same as a home that's 2000, for example, right? And they could be next door to each other because somebody bought a vacant lot in a neighborhood. And the carport's not the same thing as a garage. Correct, it's totally different, right? But that can still be used. The 1960 to 200 is totally different because the effective age is different than yeah. ours, right? Adjustments are made by differences, right? What's changed since we've closed the house? What's changed since the original house closed? In the last six months, did the market adjust? Are we in a severely declining market? Are we in an increasing market? Did the cost of materials go up? Did this house have improvements? See, all these things could have mattered, right? Property difference, location, square footage, and so forth. That's what we're talking about, right? We're making adjustments based on the differences of the property. In the appraisal world, there's six levels of condition, or C1 to C6. C6 being new construction, C3 and 4 being your average condition. Most houses are C3 and 4. C1 might be dilapidated. So C1 is the house not doing well. Right, so here's how it gets done, and this is actually on page page 370 there's a little chart it says CBS and CIA mm -hmm. so the way they do this for the adjustments to say if the comp is better we subtract the comp is inferior we add I think that's a horrible way to explain it because you get confused right number one we never adjust the subject we never adjust the subject I'm sorry we never adjust the comps. We always adjust the subject based on the comps, right? We never adjust the comp. We never adjust the subject. I said that. We never adjust the mm -hmm. subject. That's what I said first. We never adjust the subject. We're always going to change the comps based on what the subject is, right? And I, I will work through one of these at the end of the day. Here's how you do it. If the comp is bad, if the comp is bad, that means it's inferior. If the comp is bad, it's smaller. It's got one less bedroom. It doesn't have a pool. Smaller if it's box. bad, we're going to add to the price, right? Bad rhymes with add, right? Makes it easy. Mm -hmm. When you're making adjustments, bad, add, bad, bad add, right? If the comp is good, you say it's nice, right? If it's nice, then you slice. If it's nice, then you slice the price. You subtract. Because the comp is better than the subject, we're slicing the price. Because we're adjusting that comp to try to get the subject price. That makes sense. So bad ad, nice slice. I wrote it down on mine. I don't like how they write it in the book, CBS and CIA. It's confusing. Bad ad, nice slice. Rhymes. Bad ad, nice slice. Right. Makes it easy. Easy to remember, right? These are adjustments made to the comparable. Mm -hmm. Adjustments for transactional differences. So if it's a seller finance deal, right now we're doing this thing called a 2-1 buy down. A lot of lenders are doing it. So the, the, lent, the buyer is paying 1.75% of the house to lower the interest rate for a year or two years for the buyer so that we can get them to buy it. And in theory, and then it goes up. Finance. Huh? And then it goes up. It goes up. So the way it would work is if today's rate is Today's rate is 7%. So today's rate is 7%. What they would do is they would pay 1.75% of the, of the price. And, year, and so in year 2022, the rate would be 5%. The rate 2023 would be 6%. The rate 2024, the rate would be 7% and so on and so forth, it would be 7% continuing. Damn. But the theory is, is I can get somebody to qualify for that mortgage, get them in the house, hopefully they get a raise in the next two years, or rates go down in the next two years, then we can refinance it, Damn. right? This is the theory behind it. The seller pays the upfront interest. So it's, it's, called a two, it's called a 2-1 buy down. No, it's not an arm. No, it's not an arm. 2-1 buy down. Now, on top of this, the seller can buy points and lower the rate even more if they want to. 
So that that's what two one five are for right now. That's yeah, and that's what they're talking about. Appraisal adjust comparables for special financing term like seller pay points. Seller pay points would be like a two one five now, right? They're they're making adjustments to the value. Condition of sale, appraiser must research the abnormal pressure on buyer and seller. Was it a short sale or foreclosure, et cetera, right? If there's some addition, uh, abnormal pressure, then it could affect the value. Right? Market conditions, we adjust for since, how, since the comparable sold. So sometimes when we don't have enough comps, we have to go back two years, for example. Well, the market two years ago was really different, so we have to make an adjustment for time value. That's what they mean by market conditions. Right now, if you adjust for six months ago, we have to adjust it down because the market is way different today with 7.5% interest rates versus 4% interest rates in March. Right? And I kept telling people you need to watch this because the market's going to go down 10% when the rates go up 75 to 7.5%. Tomorrow. I've made a video on this in April and said rates will be at 75 by the end of the year. Guess what? Rates are seven and a half. Mm -hmm. Nobody believed me. Can you, can you it's a, on TikTok. You can look at it. You make a prediction today for what's going to be nine percent by the spring. By spring, nine percent. Oh That's my prediction. We're going to be eight percent by next week. Mm -hmm. I knew we would be seven and a half to eight percent by the end of the year. Hundred percent will be eight percent next week. Um, rates were seven point four this morning. Um, okay. The numbers came out bad. So when the Fed meets next week, we're going to have higher rates. Um, I guess three quarters of a point, maybe a point. Could be so a two one buy down will work for us in this market? It works right for now. now. Right you can now. do a three one buy down too. Three one, which is, is even better. Starts at right, so rate. it's going to be 4%, 5%, 6%, <coughs> and then 7 all the rest of the years. What? Okay, that might be the way right. to go for a lot of people. Or you buy points for five years and you deal with it. Or, you know, there's all different things you can do, right? There's things you can do to offset. So uh, one of the lenders, one of the builders is doing seven years. So in seven years, rates will probably be better. Um, the economy should be better in seven years. Right now, the global economy is bad. It's not just the U.S. So FHA doing something like that too? Um, FHA's got different rules. I'm not sure what they're doing. I have to ask. Mm -hmm. But um, so here's how we make adjustments. Where we make adjustments for transactional differences, right? Square footage is different. Mm -hmm. Landscaping. So maybe this person has 500 palm trees. Right, the other person has some ligustrum bushes that are dilapidated, right? The big difference, palm trees are a thousand bucks, right? So you do make some adjustment. Now, if you spent 5,000 on palm trees, you're probably only gonna get a thousand bucks. So you're not gonna get a lot of money, right? Maybe you built a wood deck, wood deck might be worth 500 bucks, but we make a difference, right? Then we reconcile these comps, we put all the comps together, we say, okay, this is the most like it, so we'll use this as a 55% weight, we'll do this one as 25%, we'll do this one as 30%, just for example, 20%. The, we put the, the, the closest comp to the property, and we weight that the hardest. We, we, and we'll show you how to reconcile that. So each comp's rated in similarity to the project, like the, the subject property, sorry. And give that weight to it, and then the way it comes determine the cost or the sales comparison approach. Cost approach is price says here principal substitution. So how would it be to build this same structure, and how much would it cost to build the same structure? If it's a wood frame, it's going to be cheaper than building a concrete structure, for example, right? This is what we're talking about. How much would it cost to buy the land and rebuild this property? This is what the cost approach is. This is how insurance companies value your property. Maximum value can be measured by determining the cost to acquire the property. How much did it cost to build the land or to, to buy that land out there? How much did it cost to clear it, grade it, and then build the houses on it, right? So buy the land, reproduce the structure, and then subtract for any depreciation, right? Did it depreciate over that time period, right? Well, if it's brand new, it does, it's not depreciated yet. But if it's five years old and always been vacant, there's depreciation value on it. There's also appreciation based on market conditions, but depreciate, we're talking about cost approach. So over time, things deteriorate, they're considered depreciated. So cost approach formula, we're estimating that reproduction costs 
We're subtracting this accrued depreciation. If it's commercial or residential, it's a different type of depreciation. We estimate the value of the land, and then we add the value back. Because land doesn't what? It doesn't depreciate. It never does, right? Because you can burn a structure down, but the land's still there, right? So the land's not depreciating. So here's how we estimate that. And we don't really want to go through all this, but basically you take the age of the house and you subtract the cost. So if it's like, let's say it's $275,000. The house costs $275,000. Well, on residential property, residential property, you depreciate it over 27 and a half years. We're gonna go over that, but you depreciate over 27 and a half years. Well, if it's 275,000 and you're depreciating over 27 and a half years, you're depreciating at $10,000 a year. So a house that you built in 2020, today would be worth $55,000 less. That's what this whole estimated reproduction cost would be. That's for rebuilding, not for, because remember we're rebuilding, but we're taking off the property value, the, the so that depreciation of materials, to... because as things get old, your AC breaks, your roof breaks, all this stuff happens, so it's worth less than what it was when you built it. Do they only consider that if like the house has had no rehab, meaning? Yeah, uh, it has correct, the effective rehab. age changes, and we're gonna talk about effective age. Okay, got it. So what's the cost to dupl duplicate the structure exactly? What's the cost to build the structure the same function but not exact copy, right? We're gonna estimate using square footage analysis and you're gonna see everything in the real estate business is square footage analysis. Once you get past the textbook stuff, everything's square footage analysis. You're gonna hear that all the time. Well, what's the price for square foot? Well, what's the price for square foot? That's, that's what we're looking at, right? Uh, comparative to unit or unit comparison. Um, we don't have this cost in the handbook. Uh, cost estimate is based on current cost to construct a building the same size design quality. It says the same thing over and over and over on the slide. What's the cost to rebuild it? That's what it says. We're gonna subtract the depreciation. Land is not depreciated. That's all you need to know on here. Types of depreciation. Here's your depreciation. So you have this thing called physical deterioration. That's like your roof going bad, right? Over years, right? You have your wood rot. You have all this other thing happening. You have your concrete breaking up. But that's physical depreciation. You're losing value based on ordinary wear and tear. Your vinyl floors got ripped because you slid some stuff across. Physical deterioration. Functional obsolescence would be like having a bedroom inside of a bedroom. There's houses in Mandarin where you have to go through a bedroom to get to the next bedroom. Right. That's functional obsolescence. There's not. They're not separate bedrooms. Right. <laughs> it happens. Um, over improvement is also a functional obsolescence so if everybody has granite countertops and you put in some super high-end crystal countertops you're you're over improving and you're having functional obsolescence because your value is not coming back to you right you spent a hundred thousand dollars for your countertops everybody else spent ten thousand you're not going to get that hundred thousand dollars of value right you put in a olympic sized pool in your backyard and everybody else has a little kidney shaped pool you're not going to get that value back because that pool was two hundred fifty thousand, and their pool was thirty thousand. it's like adding a second story in a neighborhood where all the houses are one well that's size that's, that's different, size. That would be different. That's different okay. right then there's this external obsolescence right well my backyard backs up to a pond for example which is a good thing but what if it backed up to a cell phone tower a sewer plant uh, power lines, railroad. major power lines, a railroad. These things are external obsolescence. They're not on the property, but they're close enough to cause you a problem, right? External obsolescence. That makes sense. Um, I have a video that I did flying a drone around where we were trying to sell these lots, and three of the lots backed up to water treatment plant. Well, in my opinion, the whole neighborhood is a problem because when the wind blows, it smells, right? So that's external obsolescence, right? But maybe there's a good obsolescence with external obsolescence. Maybe the fire extinguisher or the fire hydrant's in your yard or it's in your neighbor's yard right next door. That's actually good obsolescence because when you have it close to your property, insurance is cheap. So when insurance is cheaper, it's actually a good thing, right? So you can have that other, which makes it nice. Um, this is how we do depreciation through this age life menu uh, method, right? So 
we talk about this effective age, right? A house can be 1960, but we read the plumbing, the electric, the roof, and everything in, in 2015, right? So that effective age of that house will be seven years old, even though it was built in 1960, right? So then we take the depreciation based on that. Right here, majority of appraisers take into account the, observ the observed condition of the property, right? If you see an old house with parquet flooring, Formica countertops, nasty wood cabinets that are falling apart, and then the same house is next door with quartz countertops, marble tile floors, and you're gonna take that into consideration. The house next door is worth more, right? It's been updated. Here's how we do depreciation. Effective age divided by total economic life times the reproduction cost gives you your accrued depreciation. The alternative method is reproduction cost of new divided by total economic life equals annual depreciation. Annual depreciation times effective age equals accrued depreciation. Do you notice anything here? It's three things and then one's multiplied and two are divided. Why? Yeah, why? Why? Because this is another one of these. It's another one of the P same formula. R. P equals R times T. Times it's the same thing again. This is why I said you only need to know one formula. P equals R times T. Part equals rate times total. Well, in this case, the appreciation, the accrued depreciation will be the part. Annual depreciation and effective date would be the R and T. I mean, it's not exactly translating, but it's the same calculation. It's the same way. And we'll, once we put numbers on it, you'll see. You'll see how it works. Right? So, cost approach. Cost approach, estimated land value, land value, right? Land value, again, doesn't depreciate, right? We always, we always do the billing and then the land separate. Add land value back at the final value because we don't don't depreciate it over time and everything else. And we'll do calculations so you can kind of see what we're talking about. Um, then we have the income approach, measures the flow of income, the cash flow, right? Measures the rental income. Market value is based on how much money this property makes, right? Present worth of future income. So when you talk about DSCR loans, you talk about doing a rent schedule, that's what we're estimating the value based on that. The house is worth 170,000 because we're gonna make 700, 1,700 a month and we're using a 1% rule. So we take $1,700 divided by 0 0.01 and we get 170,000. That's how we get the value of the property. That's basically in a nutshell how that works. Types of income, we have potential gross income, right? PGI, annual income if rented with no collection loss, right? That means we're not sending it out, we're not trying to collect, we're not paying a collection company or anything like that, right? Effective gross income would be your potential gross income minus your vacancy and collection losses, right? So potential is if I booked it out 100%, right? Well, nobody ever gives you value for that when you're getting a loan. They give you this effective gross income based on like 75% occupancy, right? Because if a house is big, You've got, you're always gonna have some vacancy. So when a lease ends and somebody moves out, you're gonna have a month where there's nobody there. So that's why they take this into account. Net operating income will be your effective gross income minus any expenses you have. So maybe you have maintenance and repair. Maybe you had, uh, you paid the rent for them. Maybe you had to put a new roof on. Maybe you had to uh, have a lawn service, whatever the case is, right? So. This is the highest, this is the next one, this is the next one, so we're lowering the income, right? Your net income is what I care about, right? Maybe I have a management fee in, in there, right? So, so if Vacasa Rentals is taking 25% of my money and I have a $40,000 potential gross income, but I only had 75% occupancy, then I made $30,000 effective gross income, and Vacasa's taking 25% of that, so at the end of the day, my net income was $22,500. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Operating expenses, three types of operating expenses, right? We have reserves and replacements, we have fixed and variable expenses. So fixed expenses don't change or they change very little. Property tax and insurance. 
Variable expenses would be things that happen. Utilities, supply, like supplies, et cetera, right? If you're running a Airbnb and your toilet paper runs out, that may be different this year versus next year, right? The supply costs might go up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maintenance, maybe the roof broke a leak this year, but next year for 10 years, I don't have to do that. That's variable, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have this thing called reserve for replacement. Mm -hmm. Reserve for replacement means I know the roof is 20 years old. I know it's going to cost me $20,000. So I'm going to put $1,000 a year in this account. So at the end of 20 years, I have a way to make it work. Yeah. Like an escrow? Basically like an escrow. That's what it is. So those are your operating expenses. These are not included in operating expenses, your cost, your mortgage, your depreciation, your personal expenses, right? Traveling there and back, income taxes, and any expense that doesn't contribute to the actual operation of the property, right? But if you had a property manager, it would, because that's part of the operation. These things are for you to go up there and do things, right? These things are still good for tax purposes, right? You can still write off the fact that you had to travel up to your rental property. You can still write off the depreciation for your property, right? You can still write off mortgage interest. You can still write off all these things, right? But it doesn't take these into account when you calculate your net income. You take it into account when you look at your cash flow, but you don't, but they don't take it into account for the income, right? When they do an income analysis. So here's your, here's your formulas. I'm gonna be honest with you, you're probably not gonna see this. You're gonna see this more in broker test. This is more investment real estate is a whole chapter in the broker test. But just for basic knowledge, effective gross income is PGI minus your your vacancy cost, right? Your variable cost, sorry, your variable cost and other miscellaneous income, right? Plus other miscellaneous income. So maybe you made something back for like cleaning or something like that. Maybe maybe it cost you $100 to get clean, but you're charging $150 to get clean, mm -hmm. right? So then you're making $50 other income. And net operating income would be your effective, in, effective gross income minus your property management, for example, right? And you get your NOI. So you're just going to see this, but you don't really need to know more than how it works. Is right? this going to be on the exam or how would it It bring? possibly would, but it's not likely. Yeah, NOI, I remember that. Yeah. IRV. Hey, look at that. There's another one of those PR, right? I don't know. P equals R times T. It's the same thing. P equals R times T. This is R, this is T, this is P. It's the same thing. That right. line is a division it's sign, right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So P three. equals R times T. Rate times value equals net operating income. Net operating income divided by value equals rate. Net operating income divided by rate equals value. See what I'm saying? PRT. It keeps showing up again and again and again and again. It's the same formula. If you know how to manipulate one formula, you know nine, nine formulas. Did you need that? It's in your book. It's actually drawn in your book. It should be drawn. It's drawn in my book. Is it drawn in your book? Oh, I see it here. Yeah. What page is it? 380. Yeah, so mine's on 390. So 390. That's the formula. And then reconciling the final values. We already talked about this. You weight one. Mm -hmm. You weight one differently than the others based on the comparative value of the property. You give a higher percentage of sales comparison approach. You get, so you, you reconcile the property based on the, on the comps, but then you reconcile the values based on what you're most likely going to use that property for. That's how we get this highest and best use, right? Does that make sense? Switching gears. We have ways to estimate rent, right? So we have this thing called a gross rent multiplier, which is the ratio between the property's gross income and the selling price, right? We have a gross income multiplier includes the income and rent from other sources, right? And you multiply it to get the selling price as well. It doesn't say that on here, but that's how you get it. So these are just factors. And usually these are given to you, right? Gross rent multiplier is this. The monthly rent is this. How much is the house worth? You multiply them two together and you get the house. 
right here is talking about how to do the calculation. So you estimate the gross monthly rent for the subject property, let's say it's $2,000. Calculate this market derived gross rent multiplier by taking, a skit, by taking sale of the most comparable properties and what they rented for in the past, right? So if the house rented for $200,000, or I mean sold for $200,000, rented for $2,000 a month, you get a 10% GRM, you're multiplying it by what you're getting and that's how you're gonna get your value. Okay. Sales price divided by gross monthly rent equals your gross month rent multiplier. That's what I just said, right? So $200,000 house divided by $2,000 will give you a 10 gross rent multiplier. Take that gross rent multiplier for that comp, and the next comp was $19, the next comp was $19.50. You, you get your average GRM of $19.50, that's your GRM. You multiply that for your rent at your house, maybe it's $1,900, and then you come up with a value, it's like $188,000. That's basically how it works, right? So does that make sense? Like, I know when I talk, it's one thing, but I can, but it's really the same, no matter how you do it. Does that make sense? Don't get too caught up on this one because it's not going to be something that you're going to be given that number most of the time. You're not going to be reconciling it. After you learn all this, you're never going to do it again. It's all going to be automated for you on the system. Rental income times market area GRM is your estimated market value. So your market area GRM is based on your comparables. So you have three different values. You divide them, you average them, and then you, then you multiply it by your rent and get your Here's CMA. CMAs are not appraisals. Comparative market analysis. How many times are we saying this? CMAs are not appraisals. Three major categories of comparables. Current, recently sold, currently on the market, and recently expired listings. Only value your homes on what's sold. Do not value things or what's currently on the market because people Here's the problem. We're in a bear market right now in real estate. Most agents, over 60% of agents have been in the business less than five years. They've never seen a bear market. They don't understand pricing today. If we use their listings to price our listing, we've just shot ourselves in the foot because they don't know how to price a house. They use an automated valuation model, put it on market, which is the automated valuation models haven't caught up, models haven't caught up with the market yet. So what's happening is we're still seeing overpriced listings and they're not moving. Currently on the market is horrible, but what currently market on the, on the market does is it gives us a trend of where the market was headed, exactly. right? Recently expired listings, why would we use recently expired listings to list a house? Or to price a house. To see why houses didn't sell, they were overpriced. So the number one reason a house doesn't sell is because it's overpriced. So you use that, you don't use it to price the house, but you use it as a benchmark. If nothing sold not to do. that was 200000 then don't list your house at 200000 In fact, that's why they say use expireds. I personally don't use expireds. I use experience, but don't, you can look at them, but don't include them in your report. Because if you include them in your report, people are going to start questioning you, right? Unless you're comfortable talking on it, don't don't include it. And that's it for this chapter for the concepts. We're going to talk about how to actually do the calculations, right? so so that you can understand it. But we're going to do a separate.